Banana Slam Jam. Hello? Hello. Hey, how you doing, man? Hi, doing good. Congratulations on having Girlfriend of the Year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She's been hyping this up, telling everybody. Everyone's real hyped about it. Nice, I'm hyped man. about it. I'm ready to totally let them all down. So, uh, first off, happy birthday, dude, and uh, congratulations on, sounds like you got Divine One. Yeah, just recently. Sweet. Uh, in the last month. Okay, so what position do you play? Uh, mostly three. Okay, oh, Divine One off lane. Okay, um, sweet. So, obviously, this wasn't bought by you, but... So right. I can't ask you why you bought it, but what were the i what would you like to learn or what do you feel like is hindering you the most? Mm, I would say the main weakness I have is more mid game. I would say I usually have an at least a decent laning stage, but in terms of where to go and when to move to different parts of the map, I still struggle a bit on that. Okay. Uh, and a bit on itemization. So cool. Um, yeah, itemization is definitely super important for offlane, if anything, because you're kind of the one core that, or you're the one here on the game that gets enough farm to be a core, but you're also kind of supposed to fill in the gaps for the rest of your team, um, as a mm -hmm. core, so it's definitely probably in, in my opinion, it's probably the most important role for itemization, so, uh, obviously every role is important for items, but, uh, Okay, cool. So uh, go ahead and send me the replay IDs in Discord. This one was more of a, you know, clearly, you know, the team did well all in general, but how to propel that forward more, what I can do to take that advantage and push it further than I did. Because, you know. Yeah, no, sure. so I'm a firm believer that if you mess up anything in this game, that you'll mess it up in every single game. Because when you're this far ahead, um, in my opinion, that's when decisions are the easiest. So uh, I actually think sometimes watching one stomp replay or one where you did really well can still be educational. Uh, just because I, if I see something you do wrong here, I know you'll do it wrong in a game that's closer. So items are fine. You're against most likely a lifestealer silencer. Yeah, Lifestealer Silencer. What's your Lena have? Okay, Blightstone. Blocking the range in front. I don't mind it as a hero like Night Stalker. In these types of situations, if I block the range in front like that, I would ask my Lena to block the small camp at one minute. Most people will listen. Sometimes they just don't. But I think mm -hmm. if you're going to block the range creep in front, the only punish the opponent has is to immediately pull the small camp. Uh, and so preventing that is really important. What you can even do, depending, is have her block the small camp, and you can briefly gander over and block the big camp. And then mm -hmm. from then on, since you block the range in front, the lane's going to be here for the next three or four creep waves which is super good for a hero like night stalker that's not particularly a, a lane dominator in the first five mm -hmm. minutes of the game uh i just think this is something where every time you make a move that's good like if you make a move that's to your advantage it usually requires the opponent to counteract it in some way otherwise you just gain the advantage right mm -hmm. uh so in right. this case you made a move that gave you an advantage now I'm telling you in this specific instance what are all the ways they could counteract that and you can try to think about the game that way to yourself because at the highest level, you know, once you start hitting immortal and stuff, it becomes more and more likely that people will do that one or two things that they can do to counter your play. Uh mm -hmm. so really thinking about that in these examples is is really good. Um if you communicated to your support that they were supposed to do that and they just didn't then uh that's life. No, not so much. But so your support's bad. getting caught out. In yeah, I was case, thinking about uh, going there. Okay. But I decided not to. They got a, a little mad about it, but I mean, I'm Night Stalker level 1. I figured I really couldn't do much other than body block, take a whole bunch of damage for it. No, I agree. I agree, man, with you here. 
they definitely, when you have this many creeps against you, you're definitely not supposed to contest at all. She's just a papega doing what she did there. Um, in this case, so I've talked about this in other coaching sessions. When your guy is dying, um, what that means is you have two options. This applies to mid-game as well. Uh, just in the landing stage, it's a much smaller scale. You have two options. You have one to like force pressure or get something off the map where the opponent is not because they're killing your teammate or to help your teammate. So in the mid game that applies to like, you know, pressuring a tower or something. In the laning stage, that can be as simple as killing this range creep when you're not contested. Um, so usually uh, you don't want the lane to push into you too hard. It's already near your tier one. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, whenever your guy is getting, whenever the opponent is distracted, whatever reason, are they getting a bounty? Are they contesting your support? You should use that time to be the most efficient with lane equilibrium and all that kind of shit as possible. So right now, I'm mm -hmm. thinking you're only you've only gotten like 50 experience in this lane. Well, you're not killing any creeps, and you're a night stalker with no wave clear. So one of the most punishing things for any hero without wave clear is getting like a quad wave into their tower. Um, you want creeps to be near your tower, right? But you don't want them to just be. You don't want 10 creeps underneath your own tower. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is really important in my opinion that you could have been hitting creeps probably more often Just like casual hits to like push out the wave uh, But okay. at this very moment I would have taken this time to probably hit this range creep four times and then nuke it uh, While my Lena is getting killed The weaker one? Yeah, the one that has slightly less health. If they were the same then I would you know hit them both or hit either one doesn't really matter that's just an example where that range creep took you an extra second, and then that extra second might have made you miss this creep or something. It's just a very little efficiency that will sometimes backfire on you and just should be kept in mind. that You don't want the wave pushing against you that hard. Oh, you got the big creep? That's nice of him. Yeah, he kind of just let me do that. Okay, so you have a buckler. Don't mind the buckler. A lot of trading back and forth for a Night Stalker. I don't hate it. I'd be turning the buckler off for sure. You're not trying to push this creep wave. I don't know if that's an accident or intentional, but it's not correct. Uh, just wasn't thinking about it. Okay. Semi-intentional. What items did you fly out here? I'm not entirely sure why the AA came down. This is one of the older ones, so I can't. You have a PA remember. safe lane who is having a really rough time. So it's either they're having a really good time or a really bad time. That's the only reason people leave lanes is early, especially in your bracket. Um, okay, so definitely a big deal with this buckler staying as long as it has. You should definitely pay okay. more attention to that. It adds up a lot. Like, this would probably be an extra range creep denied for you if you uh, didn't have your buckler on. It's like, yeah, you end up getting it, but... You're just doing a lot of poor min-maxing when it comes to uh, lane equilibrium. I think it's pretty important that you should generally watch um, little things people do to correct lane equilibrium one way or the other. Sometimes it's pushing too hard against you. Sometimes it's pushing too hard for you. Right now, the buckler being on is good. Um, obviously, it's nighttime, so you're in a position of aggression. You also have a catapult. Um, doesn't mean you have to rush the push. You can you can do what you're doing where you have the buckler on and you're denying. That's honestly not terrible. Uh, yeah. yeah. At this point, I was thinking they can't really walk up too easily, so I might as well take the CS while I can. Yeah, no. I mean, you, were, you probably weren't pressuring with that catapult. I think against a hero like Lifestealer, I'm content to zone him out the way you are, especially when he's got like a silencer support. You now have phase boots, going for a bracer. It's always hard to argue against a bracer. I don't know if I would have built one this game, but I also don't think it's bad. I probably would have gotten a stick, at least maybe probably even a wand, because... Night Stalker with ult is, has serious mana issues. You do have a mango, but... So at this yeah, point, Life Stealer is just kind of not laning. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I have fallen into the habit of flying out more mangoes, I think, lately, instead of other options. 
Yeah, uh, one of my finest balances I've had to find as an offlaner is is when to spend money on regen and like when to sacrifice aggression briefly so that you're advancing your items. So like maybe you get a stick which gives you 50 mana instead of a mango for the instant 110. So maybe you're weaker in the short term, but then you'll hit a power spike at a certain point. Um, that's just an example of what I'm saying. So you are going Vlad, so you have like a bit of mana regen. Uh... And I think Vlad's is obviously a fine item on Night Stalker and most offlaners in general, but also because they have two physical damage cores. Even three if that would No, it's a core shaker. Never mind. Um, okay. Use your ult. Some of the stuff I'm seeing in this replay, I'm definitely going to wait till I see what you do in your other games before I comment on it. Because I'm not 100% sure if it's like a playstyle thing or just wrong. I, I can't really tell. So, we'll see. Just letting you know, I am seeing some stuff, but I actually am not sure on whether or not... Yeah. Or what to say about it exactly yet. Um, I'm sure there is. So, you do have... It's okay, a... so you went raindrops too. Interesting. So, that's your option for mana. Um, okay, let's just fast forward this out. You have ult. So this is an example where you're really strong. You have your ult, and you're kind of just chilling. Um, mm -hmm. what I mean is, could a support do what you're doing? Usually as a core, I ask myself this question, and if the answer is yes, then I'm probably doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a part in the game where I'm watching it as... I'm watching it from the perspective of, would I be doing something here? And the answer would be yes. And, like, what I mean is the, the reason why you don't do things is because, one, you're, like, almost to a timing. Or, like, two, if you leave, nobody else can occupy that lane. Or, three, like, if you leave, that lane's going to be under a ton of pressure. Meaning that, like, you'll lose the tower or something if you if you leave that lane. So there's these factors that are dissuading you from doing stuff. Um, and those should be incredible, like importantly considered, not only from whether or not you do things, um, but it should be considered on how quickly you return. If you go do something, meaning like if you go do something mid, do you want to come immediately back bottom or do you want to stay mid and try to pressure the tower? Um, that kind of thing. And then they also should help you as like, uh, if the life stealer were to do something, knowing what you would do in return. So, like, sometimes in certain matchups, you, it's your job to counterplay the opponent guy that you're laning against. So, like, if he goes and rotates somewhere, like, say it's a DK mid against Timber mid, you know, DK can't push into Timber, so maybe DK will run top and try to push. It's, like, that Timber's job to go top and stop him from pushing. Um, on the other hand, if that Timber were to rotate, it's DK's job to pressure mid instead of follow the temper uh that's like an example very very basic example in my opinion because it's very obvious which one does what um but in this ch in this case you're not stopping life sealer from farming yeah he's not yeah. free farming but you're not stopping him and yeah. you have your ult you're powerful you have a vlads and there's an engagement going on mid mm -hmm. so this is a perfect time where i probably wouldn't have avoided that range creep because i'm sitting at you know 250 mana and i would have little bit of this, immediately little run bit mid of here um it just doesn't hurt you at all to run mid like the potential benefit of you running mid compared to like these three creeps you're getting is mm -hmm. just so high um even if nothing happens mid you could like they have no global uh you have a pa that's farming top so you're, you're making it even less likely that the opponent will try to kill your PA. And you're just really strong. So what you can do is you can, uh, you're just min-maxing by the time, you know, when it turned day, you had no ult. Yeah, do your passive thing. You're content trading. That's great. You're content doing nothing because you're not powerful. But the minute you are powerful on any hero, Night Stalker's a, you know, very polarized hero in terms of how of powerful he is. That. You just have to make stuff happen. And what I mean is sometimes making stuff happen is effectively sitting where you are. Like, like that can be the most effective use of making something happen. Meaning like you're creating so much pressure. If you were to leave, you're giving up that pressure. 
But in this case, I definitely think you're not pressuring this life stealer. And since you are strong enough to do something, that should be like an internal signal to say, I'm moving away from this lane. Um, okay. I'm trying to give you all the factors that go into my head of potential reasons of why I would stay or leave in a lane. And that's on you to kind of like, you can review these afterwards and check how they apply to your games. Maybe one of them will come up in your mind in the middle of a game sometime. Okay, so you did go the wand. Now you're running at the silencer before he takes your thing. Don't quite get, oh, you do get the kill. Okay. Yeah, he must have gotten the last tick and then this guy stayed around forever and almost died. So now I would definitely be staying bottom. I'm done equalizing the lane equilibrium though. No more denying. So I saw you do it a couple times, but you stop now, good. So that's like a good example of you accomplishing something to the most that you can after you got something done. Now, why not do that like a minute earlier? Maybe in like a three on three, maybe in a situation where the silencer doesn't have global either, you know, um, all these things like you did the overall right thing. It just took you longer to do it than it should have. Um, and that does contribute to MMR gain or loss. So let's see, good rotation of mid at nighttime, very natural progression after you take the tier one bottom. Yeah. I'm definitely way more aggressive just at night. Yeah. As you can see by how crazy I'm running around everywhere. I see this. No, this is overall good. And I think the thing is that it's easy. I hate to say it. It's easy to just be like, oh, it's nighttime. I'm going to run at people. Um, I think it's also important that when you have your ultimate and you're in a state of like doing nothing that you should also have the awareness there. So like that's the next step. When I say it's easy, I mean for a Divine 1 player, like, you know, you're you're good enough to the point where I'd expect you to go do things if you if you're a nighttime night stalker. Um so in this case there's really no major objective to take. PA is not a hero that wants you to play around him. If you're content just farming, like controlling the map, since you're obviously up by a lot, then obviously just farming a lane and controlling the entire area of the bottom half of the map is an effective use of your strength, I would say here. Um, and since you didn't have your ult, you're not ultra powerful, but you are very hard to kill and you do control the bottom area. I probably would have stayed bottom. I have full vision. I have a Vlad's. There was a catapult there, I believe. I think this is just a bit rushed. I would have probably forced somebody to come bottom and then do what you're doing here. Uh, I think that's going to naturally lead you to have much more successful engagements. If you just, even if you just force a wind ranger to TP bottom or something, because the minute you see that TP bottom, you can just clean sweep this way where you run to their triangle and you know, whatever hero TP bottom is just not going to be there. Um, mm -hmm. the way you're doing this is effectively accomplishing the same thing, but the opponent can potentially group up as five while the way I was doing it, they can only group up as four so uh okay. just a slightly better option there um okay so they do have blink shaker i don't think you know that yet though so you're doing like a good job of positioning yourself on the map i just think that bottom lane not being pressured is effectively making your pressure mid unimpactful comparatively um okay so it's gonna be most likely a decent engagement when it's nighttime old for you this is this is scary stuff though. Yeah, I mean that just shows how strong you are when you're this far ahead. But even then, I think you guys gave them the best fight they could have asked for, given the circumstances of how far behind they are. So because your PA isn't rotating away from top, and PA is not really a core that wants you to play around her at this point, I think it's fine that you never went top. Um, hmm. If that PA was like a Jug or maybe a Slark or something. Maybe they'd want you to come to them just for a quick gank. But PA is definitely the type of hero that just wants to get her uh, Battle Fury and hit some neutrals. Yeah, so every, all the space, go ahead. I was going to say, every once in a while in these games, I do offer to swap lanes to like let the carry take the bottom since it's easier in terms of like farming efficiency, I know. But half the time they do, sometimes they don't. Generally, a Night Stalker, I wouldn't take top lane. Uh, he's not really a dead lane farmer. Okay. Um, I think, you know, the Timbers of the world, the Abaddons, those type of heroes can be dead lane farmers. But uh, Underlords, I would say Night Stalker is not one. Uh, the three heroes you linked me are pretty much not dead lane farmers. You have Mars, Centaur, and Night Stalker here. So, um, 
I'll talk about what I think of these heroes in general, and if anything you have strongly disagrees with that, um, you know, you're welcome to say. I'd say the Axe is, like, okay. I, they obviously did nerf it a lot. Uh, I personally would have... It's like, you're having such a good game, and I also think if I have, like, a BKB, it's impossible to lose fights. So, like, I'd probably even just go BKB here, and then Solar would probably be my next item. Uh, for Roche, you have Vlad Solar for Roche, and BKB means you're pretty much unkillable. I don't think you really need to clear waves, nor do you need to farm neutrals because you have a PA and a Void Spirit. So, um, it's kind of like in your bracket, if you feel the need to, like, if you really just don't think you can trust your other cores to carry you, then you can go for items like this Agonyms to help your farm. But if we're talking, like, in a team game where we do trust our teammates, they seem to be doing their job. I would not like this Ags. Um, okay. The games where I want Ags on Night Stalker, it's just like buying Wave Clear on any other hero. It's like I look at my team, I look at their team, and it does seem like a threat where their team's going to out-push us in Waves. Like, I just don't think that's going to happen, right? Even Lena's a pretty decent... Uh, Mm -hmm. wave clearer so you have a lot of wave clearers you don't really have anybody that just runs into the fight first um and i think void spirit pa are very much enabled by somebody who just runs into the middle of the fight since you don't have any hard initiation the best way to start fights is to actually just run at them right um so yeah. these are all the things i'm thinking about where if i just buy bkb i can just run into them and um It'll just be really easy. I think you can still do everything you're doing right now, but if they choose to fight you, they just have no chance. While going for this item that's greedier that you don't have to go for, uh, mm -hmm. they like I'm telling you ne not to never go Ags on Night Stalker. I'm being clear to you and everyone that you have Wave Clear, so you don't necessarily need to build it. Um, I think Halberd after the BKB would have been fine. Like I, I said, Solar, but I think Halberd would have been reasonable. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next two games. I think uh, I've seen enough from this one, and I want to see what uh, what you're doing in maybe slightly less ideal games, but also on different Oh, yeah. Levels. Mars is, like, opposite end. The centaur is more the middle. Okay, so this is going to be a yikes game, huh? Oh, yeah. 42 there's minutes, a... 5 and 11, okay. Yeah, with, with the job I have, there's some weeks I can only play, like, two or three times and i'm missing a lot of abilities a lot of rust so i don't nearly as much care about the ability usage um if you are just missing abilities you know unless there's something i can actually tell you about missing your ability i'll usually just say you know you got to practice this hero more um this is a very rough mars game i have to assume you picked it pretty early when did you pick it do you remember or no um it was early Typically, in the first or second round, I'll pick to let, let see if I can see one or two in last. So you picked it, you saw a clockwork, and then you picked it? Yeah, so you saw clockwork and picked it. I mean, I personally wouldn't pick Mars into clockwork, um, just because he is kind of countered by clockwork. I've kind of learned that if I'm going to pick first, that my hero has to be really good against what I see. Uh, otherwise my game's gonna be really hard. So, because dealing with, like, one or two counters is playable, but when you have a Clockwork Batrider, uh, on the opponent team, plus, you know, a bad lane that they picked into, uh, the game should be pretty tough. So, I mm -hmm. would first recommend if you see Clockwork, uh, I personally would pick stuff that just doesn't die to Clockwork. You can go, mm -hmm. like, Timbersaw, Abaddon, Legion... Uh, I'd say the Batrider, uh, Necro, Pangolier. You know, I'm naming heroes that either have a way out of cogs, or if they cog you, you kind of just go like, "What are you doing?" and then you kill them, kind of, kind of thing. Um, okay, so just naming some examples. Mars isn't terrible here, but I'm just giving you an idea that I have had games where I just pick and. I feel like no matter how well I played, I, I lost in the draft, and I learned that it is a lot about picking good heroes against what I see specifically. Um, and the only information you had this game was Clockwork. But Mars isn't by any means a, a terrible pick. Okay. 
Yeah, it seems like your landing mechanics overall are pretty good. Oof. It was a close one. Yeah, that was close. But I at least died second. I do like the wand early here. Uh, I think the item here was good. You're just against a troll who uses a lot of spells, even disruptors kind of spammy. That was a cute little play you went for, it just didn't work out. Yeah, yeah I was trying to get the deny. Tower had me going left and right, man. Yeah, I see that. I'm actually going to rewind to see if you could have done anything about that. Sometimes you just can't. So, you took an engagement outside of the creep wave. Yeah, you're using spear to fight them outside of the creep wave. Okay, so yeah, this was all reasonable. Okay. I mean, to be honest, Troll's not even very good against Mars, so this guy didn't really hard counter pick you, thankfully. Anytime they pick a carry that doesn't die to Arena, I tend to think it's a hard matchup. But Troll does, so... Okay, so DP's kind of owning. I do remember that, now that you mention it. I think uh, when I'm at this point in the game, I'm thinking, like, what am I going to do with my first arena? Uh, I also think you might be prioritizing Buckler too highly. I think if if I'm not concerned about taking their tower, then I'm not going to buy a Buckler. Because it doesn't actually help you at all. Like, you got the two health... You got the two armor from Ring of Protection, and then you're paying 350 gold for for three all stats or 300 gold for two all stats unless you're pushing the tower so in this game specifically i i wouldn't plan to push the tower against troll um the soul ring would have allowed you to rotate earlier and then you maybe could have gone phase boots uh afterwards i just think you're kind of neutering yourself to rotate right now based on your regen which is i think a big deal when the opponent mid is doing so well and your hero actually kills that hero. So now that you're full health, full mana, I would be. I haven't seen your player perspective move at all. <coughs> so I don't know how much uh, Mars you've played, but you whatever you are silver tier, so you played a decent amount of Mars. So on um, and off, yeah, yeah. So the big thing about every off laner I play, you know, if it's an initiator, I think who can I threaten? If it's a tanky hero, I think who threatens me? Uh, you know, these are the type of things I think about. Uh, so, like, when I go into this game, I know as a Mars that I'm very unlikely to rotate against Batrider. Like, Batrider's lane, if I TP there, unless we're getting, like, three kills, I don't ever want to lane there, because I can't lane against Batrider Clockwork. So I'm very unlikely to ever go to my bottom lane. Like, that that's my first thought. Um, my second thought is, yeah, I have pretty decent kill potential on the troll, and I have decent kill potential on the DP. So then at that point, I ask myself, you know, what hero should I prioritize uh, based on the given circumstances of the game? And I see this this DP get a triple kill six and a half minutes into the game or so. And my immediately thought is, I need to rotate on this DP as soon as I possibly can. Maybe that won't be for a while. Some games, like, your ability to do things won't happen for a long time. But in this case, uh, I'd be checking out the DP. I'd be looking at her items. I'd be looking at, you know, if she has a rune bottled. These types of things. Just because she is a target of yours that you should be considering because of how well she's doing. And if you were to get one kill with your arena, it'd be super impactful. 
So I don't want right. you to feel forced to do anything, right? I'm not telling you leave your lane right now, go do something, because you are getting levels. Mars is a very level dependent and farm dependent off laner. So usually after the laning stage, this hero doesn't farm too much, which means that uh, you know the early levels for him are very important. He's kind of like Axe, where he has like a really nice start, and then eventually he's kind of stops farming, but. Um, he can if your team's winning, but if he's behind, he usually ends up with no items. That's kind of how Mars goes. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's a major deal that I haven't seen you check the DP once. Up until this point, you really didn't have the regen, so at least you got yourself back up to full there. Uh, okay, so you push out the wave. It's nine and a half. So, if I was against nothing that killed me, I would have done straight, like, I would have walked straight from here to here. Like, I would have just gone straight from where you are, like, beeline it to mid lane. But I am okay. a bit scared of Clockwork, I will say. Like, a level 3, uh, he's level 5, fuck. A level 3 or 5 Clockwork would be really annoying for you. Like, imagine if you ran into a level 3 or 5 Clockwork with a core nearby. Like, with any of the opponent cores nearby. Aren't you probably dead or taking, like, most of your health? And yeah, damage. I need to get a good spear. Yeah, it's going to be really hard. Like, best case scenario, you're going to spear them away. But, like, it's just not a good thing for you to run into a clockwork. So, I think about that when I'm rotating. I'm like, if, what are the combinations or, like, specific heroes that I really don't want to run into? Um, and say it was clockwork in this case, and I just see clockwork. Like, say one of these two heroes showing on the minimap is clockwork. Then I'm going to beeline it to mid. But this is another perfect example where... Um, you're very killable if you try to push their tower, and you're not really shutting down the troll, you're just kind of combating him, and you have a big ult that can be used on something. So this is another example where you push- on Mars it's a bit different than Night Stalker. On Night Stalker, you should have just ran mid, but because Mars can just soul ring and nuke the wave instantly, I think it was good that you nuke and clear the wave. I think it would be bad to rotate on a hero like Mars if there was a lane to clear, and you just didn't, even though you were right there to clear it, just because the hero does it so fast. So you clear the wave. Now this is your chance to rotate. Like, this is the best opportunity to rotate. This is all the stuff you're thinking in your head, like, oh, DP, um, like, is one of my crucial targets. I see her walking through a ward. We have another good ward here. Uh, if a fight breaks out, it's either going to be around mid-tower or my own team's outpost, the bottom one. Uh, yeah. I think you could agree that it would be much better to take a fight around here than it would be here. Can you agree with that? Or uh, I can't. I can't see. What oh, you're you right. can't see my mouse. I think it'd be much better to fight around mid or bottom outpost than it would be to fight around top outpost. Would you agree? Yeah. Just be based on sheer numbers of heroes on each team that can be in both places, right? Like yeah, uh, and like, the enemy team can TP in. Exactly, and, and like you'd be two v five potentially top. Um. And bottom, you could easily have five heroes there, at least four, um, depending on your Snapfire showing up or not. So this is an example where I probably would have walked like this. I probably would have gone right here. Like, because you're not going to run into Clockwork, most likely. I could have told you since he's missing that he's probably somewhere around this outpost because he's not bottom. Like, he's not contesting your heroes, and the only objectives for him to be around are mid and the two outposts, and he's not around either of these. So, uh, he's probably here. Uh, I, I didn't even know that when I told you, but I, that's like my guess. I would say, I assume he's going to be around this area. He's either like right here or he is like right here. And both cases, it would benefit you to walk this way because you could either TP bottom or fight mid. So, uh, I'm giving you all the reasons why walking towards mid would be great. And this is these are the reasons that apply every single game, like, just differently. Um, and these are the type of things that you need to think about when you're looking to make your rotations. Um, so this naturally leads to you kind of wasting mana, wasting time, dying? Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. Um, so all this combined, like, I'm telling you all the reasons why you should go to certain places, and by not following that logic you're going to put yourself in situations that are much less likely to be good for you so in this case i told you if you run into a clockwork plus a core that's really bad for you and what do you know you ran into clockwork plus a core and you died um so i'm just looking for on the map whether or not it's heroes i'm playing against whether or not it's heroes i'm walking into whether or not it's heroes i'm trying to kill who do i match up against in what way 
Um, so UT being top here is very committal. If you do this TP and you walk up to this tower and you get forced to walk away and that feels like crap, you shouldn't make this TP. Um, because I would really only TP here if I felt like me making this TP controls this part of the map and I'm going to get this tower unless they bring like four or five heroes. The reason why I'm talking about not using your TP is because I really think against a hero like DP, you should always, if possible, have a TP to defend your towers. Uh, you, sh you should just always have one. Uh, and unless her ultimate's on cooldown, which it is. But even then, um, she's going to keep nuking in your midwave. And your Razor is pretty strong, despite the fact that uh, he's got the 420. He, despite the fact that he's only got a Mask of Madness, this hero is pretty scary. I don't know why people are doing this Mask of Madness crit build on everybody, but okay, so let's, let's just say that I just want you to realize how big of a commitment it is to top wave that you go, that you TP here like this. Uh, okay, so you do ult defensively. Yeah. So I don't know how to better describe this, but you're against Disruptor, you're against Clockwork, you're against a troll who at this point you really can't kill. I don't know if you've recognized that yet, just based on how everyone's doing in the game. And you're against a Disruptor. I think I might have said that, but Disruptor, Clockwork, Bat. Those are the three heroes that really stand out to me. If I walk up to a tower and one of them teepees in front of my face, what's going to happen to me? Oh, death, probably. You're going to die. Like, Batrider teepees in front of my face, he's going to chase me down. Clockwork teepees in front of my face, he's going to flare and hook me. Disruptor teepees in front of my face, he's going to glimpse me. Like, I'm going to die. So I can't walk up to towers alone. I just can't do it. Like, that's how I think about Dota in any game. I'm like, if I walk up to this tower, you know, what's going to happen if somebody TP's in? What's going to happen if this hero's missing? All that kind of stuff. And in this case, to me, it just seemed really obvious if you walked up to this tower, nothing good was going to come of it. That's also why I wouldn't have TP top because I'm gluing myself to a lane that I don't think anything good can happen from. Like, if there's nothing else to do in the game, then yeah, go to this lane, right? But don't TP there, because if there's nothing else to do right now, or like if there's nothing to do now, like you don't feel good about going top, you don't feel good about going mid, you don't feel good about going bottom, then you're TPing to somewhere you don't feel good about. Like that's that doesn't feel good at all. Like you're just stuck there now. Um, but if you walk top, you push out the wave, you like see a TP in or something, you immediately TP mid and you make something happen. Either way. It may still fail, like you may still end up dying, but your odds of dying are much less if you TP, if you save your TP. So it's just an example of, you know, I saw your TP, I was like, I don't really know, I don't really like this all that much. I don't mind that he's going here, but I don't know why he committed to this lane. Just remember, if you TP, you are stating, I am going to be here for the next 80 seconds. You're telling that to the opponent team, you're telling that to your team, you're telling yourself that. Okay, so this time you walked top. You TP to mid. Sadly, your ult was three seconds cooldown. But look at this. You had a TP for mid. Things are going well. Confusion from BSJ. Cool. Okay. Nice. You guys got a good fight. I'd say overall, that's everything you've done now is reasonable. What do you got? Phase boots? Okay. You see four mid, no ult. You need to TP on you, but you're flying it to yourself. Okay, all this is reasonable. You haven't looked at mid. I think this is a major deal. I, what you're doing on the map is fine, but you haven't looked at anything. So I have no information of what's going on in the rest of the map based on your perspective. TPing here is danger zone. Um, they almost certainly have this warded. If... You didn't realize the likelihood of them having it warded if you don't have it warded is, is very high. Uh, okay, so now we're just taking a fight in the dead lane. Super uncoordinated, awkward fight in the dead lane. Cool. So, yeah, that's an example of I'm the offlane initiator, I'm the playmaker, I go to the part of the map with no vision, the dead lane... My team's innately or naturally going to follow me because I'm the playmaking initiator. My team follows me. We're taking mm -hmm. a fight in the dead lane and the opponent vision, and we all feed. That's like, I'd say 70% your fault. Uh, because mm -hmm. I, I just ask yourself if you're like a razor, what do you, who are you naturally going to gravitate towards on your team? 
if you're Razor? Uh, well, it would be me with ultimate. Like he's not... gonna play around you, right? Like that's his. Yeah. That's who he's gonna play around. So anytime you're that hero for your team, and a bad and a fight happens in a bad place, you should have asked yourself why you got there in the first place, what led up to that, what you could have done to avoid it. So we're gonna rewind. Like that's like this is how you can review what happened here. So your jug's obviously farming the bad part of the map. Uh, you took a tower here. This is good. But your jugs find farm, farm bottom just because um, they're all showing mid. You got a decent trade out of this for them committing five man mid. I'd say this is all acceptable. You clear this wave. This is good. Your jug's gonna. Do oh, your jug actually gets out, and you TP bottom. So this is just. I'm gonna be honest with you. Did you consider? Are you help? Are you gonna save your jug? If if he like, let's be honest. If you TP here, is it gonna change whether or not your jug lives? Doesn't make sense. Like... Uh, probably not. No. No. All the all the enemies are there anyway. Yeah. So you just saw them as five mid. So unless you are proven otherwise, meaning like they show one bottom and they show one top, you should automatically assume what they're doing is what they were just doing. Um. So that's how I look at Dota. Like, if uh, I see four heroes bottom, and then two of them go off map. I then have to assume they're either behind their team bottom or TPing to a place that makes sense to them. So, like, if I'm pushing top tower and I'm scared of one of those two heroes TPing, I'm going to treat it like they're either staying together or doing whatever they would do if they were to separate. So, in this case, if the opponent were to separate, where would they have gone? Uh, they just took mid tower. Mid. They would have gone yeah. through your jungle, or what's the passive approach? Where else would they be? Uh, near their triangle, if they were more passive. I would say, like, <coughs> they would they would either... Okay, I guess that's reasonable, but that doesn't show you anything. So where are they going to show? Like, where are they going to be if they show? They're either going to be in your jungle, or they're going to be here. Or they're going to be uh, top lane. Like, that's the okay. two places they're going to go. And I try to enforce this as much as possible about the dead lane but the dead lane is dangerous unless they prove it to you otherwise that they're not there like if they tp their strongest hero top suddenly the dead lane's not dangerous anymore like that's an example of what i mean um like if their death prophet if, like say their death prophet has the ultimate and she's the only one that dictates their team fight and she's she tp's top suddenly bottom lane may still be dangerous for like a support but it's probably much safer for like a jug Oh, that's an example of what I mean. But the, obviously, I don't know how many times people have to die down here to like realize it sucks. But um, unless you have a specific reason to be in this lane, you should just never be here. So this is an example of a TP where I'm not a completely upset that you TP'd. It's kind of a panic reaction. It happens to all of us where you saw your jug getting gone on, you're the offlaner, etc. But these TPs do matter. So, mm -hmm. first off, you need to realize the TP was bad. And the second off, you need to get the fuck out of here. Like, as quickly as possible. Because any time you spend down here makes it more and more likely your team's going to fight here, which makes it really bad. Um, this is why, oftentimes, during times where they show mid, and you, like, clear top, that good players will go sit in the trees. Like, they'll go hide in the trees. Because they don't know what the opponent's doing. If they see four heroes show bottom, they're going to suddenly clear one more wave top. If they see nobody show then they'll sit there until they do. And either somebody's going to show in their lane, which means they can maybe leave or set up a kill on them, or they're going to see people elsewhere and they can kill one more wave. But it's like any other option is really bad. Immediately TPing away, walking through their jungle, because if they are there, you're going to die. Um, that kind of stuff, right? The only good option is to go sit in the trees. So uh, that's like, you know, eternal envy, you know, hide in the trees or whatever you said. So yeah, this is an example where it's just never good to be down here. If you're the playmaker, your team's going to come to you. Shocker. Because you left top, nobody on the opponent team is top. So all the reasons that going to the dead lane are wrong apply here. Okay. So you guys are back. So... You guys are, since you're down by like 4,000, or you were down by 4,000, I would say, 
I would want you to watch this replay back and see what map distribution looked like when you were top. What I mean by that is how much each team was farming, where people were allowed to play, and then watch what happened after you TP'd bomb. And, like, see the difference here. Like, you were clearing this entire area up top. And your team, your jug was farming around here, albeit dangerous. He was farming around here, and then you had three heroes around here. So you guys were effectively farming three different parts of the map. But ever since you TP'd bottom, that's just like, you've had four heroes uh, around bottom tier two, and your and uh, I believe your jug was like around mid. And so your map control went from the entire top half of the map, plus a little bit of mid, to like your tier two bottom to your tier two mid. Like that's where your team has now played for the last three minutes. And I'm just pointing this out to you, mm -hmm. because when you're in a rough spot, I've talked about this so many times. If you watch my Miracle replay that I reviewed on, um, that's up on YouTube, I talked about how if like, you're in a rough spot and you have like one really bad TP from any core position, it can make the game that much harder. And usually what I try to understand is when I look at the replay, what my TP did. So in this case, you had lost all momentum top lane. It allowed the opponent to play five man in your jungle. You're all there. You're down by 4,000 gold. And they're fighting you on their vision up by 4,000 gold. So that's like purely good for them. Usually when you are behind, you want to force the opponent to separate to the best of your capabilities and then fight them. Or avoid fights as long as you can until you have your power spike or whatever. I personally would not have gone Vlad's this game. Um, yeah, I understand that they have DP plus troll. I think your game is too hard. So like Vlad's is a nice luxury item. I don't think you have the luxury to build it. I would have probably just gone straight blank after the buckler. Um, your team has no okay. stun other than you. Uh, so in the game where you're behind, it often requires things to be changed. What I mean is whatever items any of us are going, they have to change the state of the game. And Vlad's is just an item that buffs everyone up. It doesn't actually change anything about whether or not you guys win fights. Like, yeah, I understand it's a bit of armor or whatever. But I guarantee you, if you look at their heroes and you look at yours, you're either going to win or lose the fight, regardless of having a Vlad's. Like, it's not going to change whether or not you win the fight. You, you know, blink spearing the DP into your team, that could win you a fight that you were never going to win otherwise. Uh, you know, that's an example of what I mean. So, and prior to you having blink, I don't really know how your team's ever going to start the fight. I, I think you're always going to get initiated onto uh, which I would have looked at that and said, okay, I think we're down. You know, we've lost more towers than they have, et cetera, et cetera. And their team fight is really scary. What can, like, at what point can the team fight dynamic change? You know, what is it something I can do? Is it something one of my teammates' items needs to be? Like, do I need my BK, do I need my Razor to have a BKB when he runs in? You know, what do I need on my team? And I'd say for you, it's Blink Dagger 100%. So. Um, I don't think Pipe's going to make or break anything. Uh, they have too much physical damage for Pipe to matter, I think. And, uh, like, Pipe is an item that you build on, like, a Badden when you guys are unkillable. So you make yourselves more unkillable, right? Like, you make it even harder to kill you. This is a game where they don't have problems killing you. You need to farm your way back up a bit. And you need to hit the time that you can actually fight them as soon as possible. So that's, like, uh, the diagnosis I have of the, of the issues you guys are having right now. Um, so you are still bottom a bit. Um, okay. Okay. That rider just walking here alone. You guys do have vision now. Okay. Didn't, didn't exactly hit him, but, uh, e either way you guys got the kill. I think the opponent kind of handed you those kills. We have a smoke now with no arena. It is in 1920. This is... In my opinion, incredibly telegraphed, but in pubs, sometimes that still works. I don't know who called the smoke. Maybe it was you, maybe it was your team. Uh, I, can't, I can't quite remember. I would guess it's probably your team. And in this case, you just need to have the discipline to ping your ultimate and you know show that it's on 40 second cooldown and just not take that fight. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you have arena, that fight just looks way different, uh, but you didn't. I also think that since no pressure has ever been created top, that any move you make to bottom is is very obvious. Like if you think about it, a lot of times when you when you're not pressuring any lanes, it's just really easy for the opponent to tell what you're doing. But say top lanes at their tier two, mid lanes here, uh, sorry, like past the river, 
Um, you could be roaching. You could just be jungling. You could be smoke ganking. But there's no idea. Like, there's no way to for sure know. And good players would have to play around all three of those options. They're afraid of you smoking. They're also going to flare the roach pit. You know, they're all like, if say they don't have a clock, maybe they'd have to scout with a certain hero or something. Um, mm -hmm. But in this case, if you're not pressuring top and you're not pushing mid and you're all missing, there's only one thing you can be doing, and that's ganking them. And so yeah. oftentimes people will be much more prepared for that. Um, okay. In the Night Stalker game, you seemed pretty content to stay top, and that was because you were winning. Um, now you need to realize that uh, if you're losing and you leave top, it has to be very important. Otherwise, it's super awkward uh, for the entire team to do anything, really, because you're, you know, the, the, you're the catalyst to your team having good team fights. So I understand the aura item approach. I've already talked about it a bit. I do think the blink would have just been better here. I think you can go like blink back into Vlad's if you want, but I personally would go blink BKB here. I think playing BKB without, again, playing without BKB against Batrider Disruptor Clockwork sounds really tough. So you guys do have a lot of ultimates. You guys get them all off. You're down by 6k, but I think this fight was reasonable to take. Um, the, sadly, the, the troll BKB is The BKB kind of ruined us. Yeah, the BKB DP. So you end up buying back and TPing behind. Oh yeah, I mean this game is just really hard now that you buy bought back. I think the point here is, no matter how much you tank up from aura items, you're still very killable to their entire lineup, and I that's why I'm not a huge fan of the aura items here. Uh, I don't have a better way to describe that. I think being divine one, you can grasp what I'm saying, right? Like where even if you yeah, take yeah, it's kind of wasted gold at this point. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so... Okay. So at this point, we're kind of just clawing our way back into the game, or at least trying to, and it's not going to work most likely because we're down by 10,000 gold. You guys do get the DP, though, so it's a good start. Yeah, there was a chance at one point, but it, it quickly slipped away again. Yeah, I'll see what uh, I'll see what you end up doing here. If nobody's holding on to those spider legs, I would take those for sure. It looks like your jug's taking them off. Okay, so you guys get a few kills here. You look to force Roche. This is all good. I mean, you just have to fight them at this point. You guys can't farm, so... Wherever the fights are brought to you at 25 minutes in the game, you just do it. If the opponent's nice enough to grace you with a fight, then you take it. Uh, okay. Jug lost Aegis. Oops. Need to slow that down, not to fast forward. Let me rewind. To what led up to that, and we'll probably wrap up this replay here. Is it just your Jug getting caught? All of them are alive. Your Jug yeah, getting was, caught. I was trying to farm the Blink up, and yeah. Yeah, I see. He got that, cut yeah. out, and I tried to react. And it was <coughs> too late at that point. Yeah, there's not much you could do about, about this specific instance, so. Okay. Um, yeah, I think between the two games, the real commonality is uh, the lack of understanding to just rotate casually um, with the intent that something might happen, but it doesn't have to happen. Uh, okay. It really comes down to risk reward. You know, if I rotate here, how good could it be? And if I stay in my lane, how much do I gain Do I by staying? So it's like, if I leave the lane, how much am I giving up to leave? And then weighing that against the possibility of the benefits of like killing two of their heroes. Um, that I think in the Night Stalker game, you were just really strong and you gave the opponent the chance to potentially win a fight mid because you weren't there. In the Mars game, they had a DP that was like, you know, 4-0. and And a lot of times in high tier Dota, if there's a DP like 4-0 and, and you guys are down by 3,000, you make a move on the DP. If you kill her, you're back in the game. If you don't, you lose. Like, that's pretty much how, like, really high-tier Dota would go. Um, but I just think the major emphasis would be, like, when you see that, to look for your first opportunity. Check the DP's items. Make sure you're aware, you know. Look for these li lines of winning the game. It's, you know, win conditions, timings. Um, at your point, your Divine 1, I think you can start thinking about these things. Start considering um, when you're watching Dota. You know, I know you said you have a, you know, you're not able to play as much Dota as you want, 
But if you start thinking about these things on like one hero, like just say you pick Mars 10, 15 games in a row, you'll start noticing how it applies to Mars. And then like, I would recommend not just going from hero to hero, practicing this idea of when I should rotate. You should mm -hmm. take all the things I've talked about when it comes to rotating, but play the same hero over and over again so that you can, uh, like these are very fine things that you learn on each specific hero, but you'll start seeing overlaps. You know, you'll start seeing good opportunities. The two of them were when it came down to you were controlling your lane or you were able to push your lane, you pushed it, and then you just sat there instead of looking to rotate when you push the wave. I think that's a major one. So, Okay, moving into the third game. We have... Uh, we have a Centaur game. So Centaur is what I call like a one-position offlaner. So like for the first 15, 20 minutes of the game, you are a one-position. <laughs> like if you're not getting good farm, this hero blows. Um, so... You're against Lifestealer, pretty common pick against uh, against Centaur. This matchup has gotten worse for Lifestealer. You actually took Double Edge, interestingly enough. I guess maybe that was to secure creeps. I do think you're over-purchasing Buckler. Mm -hmm. It is not an automatic purchase every single game. That is 350 gold. That could be boots. It could be a chainmail. It could be... Even a windlace. It could be, you know, a lot of things. I don't think Bracer does all that much for you against Lifestealer. He's primarily physical damage. Um, against their lineup specifically, since they have Pangolier, Lifestealer, Meepo, I would have highly prioritized movement speed because for the first 10, 15 minutes of the game, their primary way of killing you is by walking at you and slowing you. So I probably would have gone phase windlace as fast as I possibly could have gotten it. And then okay. from there... Um, looking at my heroes and looking at theirs, I probably go Crimson Guard or at least a Vanguard into Blink, you know, one of the two. Uh, I just think Crimson's really good against Meepo. It's pretty good against Lifestealer now since Feast doesn't do damage. And it's even decent against, like, Pangolier. So, um... I didn't consider it, but I didn't end up going it. Yeah, and this is just a thing where I'm now watching you. I think you're you're around the bracket where if you just go decent items every game, you, you'll be fine. But you're not going to climb very quickly if you just keep going the same items over and over again. Um, so when I'm talking about... Remember how I talked about with Mars, I'm thinking, you know, at what point can I do something different? Um, do I need more regen? Do I need my Blink Dagger? These types of things to initiate onto them. But you're a Centaur. You want to be farming for the first 10 or 15 minutes of the game, maybe popping your ultimate, maybe showing up to one or two fights, right? Like, that's, that's Centaur. If you watch... High-level centaurs, the dream is to never leave their lane. That's the dream. Sometimes, you know, the game goes crazy. You have to do that. But that's the dream. So if I'm going to be farming for 10 or 15 minutes, my sole purpose has to think, how do they kill me? So how can I accelerate my farm while also not dying? Like, that's... And on offlaners, usually your skills are what help you farm. You know, on carries, you have to buy, like, maelstroms and stuff. But on offlaners, it's usually your skills. So, like, it's your return. It's counter helix. It's firefly. It's... Underlord's Firestorm. Those are the things that get you farm. So most of the time, it's just itemizing not to die. It's not really itemizing to farm faster. Usually, you just innately farm on offlaners. So in this game, like I said, I'm looking at their heroes. They have to walk at you. Um, phase Windlace would go a long ways in this specific game. And I think Bracer and Buckler doesn't change all of that much. Uh, it's obviously never terrible to buy those types of items, but I do not think they are the best items. Okay, so... You definitely leave that buckler on every game, so definitely get in that habit. Very strange habit to be Divine One and have, to be honest with you. Everyone has weird habits. So, I know I've kind of alluded to this already. Um, you said you had kind of some issues with itemization, and mm -hmm. uh, you said that coming into the session. The fact that I've seen you buy, like, Bracer Buckler every single game and then leave your Buckler on, what that tells me is you just do the same thing and you don't consider what every item actually does for you. So, mm -hmm. I'm immediately telling you right now that you should watch a few replays of a specific hero. These are all things to work on one at a time, please, by the way. Don't... Don't try to work on itemization as well as rotating properly, you know, as well as everything else. 
all at once because you're just going to complop and do nothing correctly. That's what I have done in the past. So uh, my point being, though, is watch players and see what they're specifically buying in specific lanes. If you can do it in the laning stage, you'll do it way better in the mid game as well. If you can't do it now in the first like seven or eight minutes with these like 400 gold items, you're not going to be able to do it with blink or vlads or, you know, that kind of stuff. Cause in the blink vlad scenario, you're considering all 10 heroes in the game and your impact in team fights and stuff. In the laning stage, you're purely considering who you're laning against, like, and maybe rotations from one hero or something. Um, and if so, if you can't itemize properly against the two or three heroes that are involved with you in the first 10 minutes, then there's no way you're going to do it when it comes to mid-game team fights. Uh, so, you're de I, I usually recommend kind of just autopiloting items and for like 3k, 2k players, but you are definitely past that point, and it's mm -hmm. it's now very important to uh to branch out from there so i think your starting items are reasonable you've gotten the same starting items every game but i also think those are pretty reasonable starting items so um good kill there uh i really do just look at this and, th and just think if you had like phase win lace it'd just be strictly better you're not really you are pressuring the tower a bit with this buckler uh but even then you could have gone you know phase then buckler and had the buckler right now rather than having it two minutes before the catapult. Because if you're like, I'm buying this buckler to pressure this tower, then the buckler timing should line up for when you are pressuring the tower. And if you buy a buckler and you never a single time pressure the tower, then you shouldn't have bought that buckler. So if you know why you're supposed to buy a buckler, and then it never happens and you bought the buckler, you could be like, oh, I shouldn't have bought a buckler this game. Like, why did I think I could pressure the tower but didn't? But if you don't think about it like that, then you'll just buy a buckler and not really know whether or not it was it was correct so okay uh feel free to ask questions i know i've been kind of continuously talking for no no it's good it's i uh definitely lack a lot of the the deeper knowledge from i mean i think your overall like much. mechanics and execution are pretty good i just think like it, I, 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 for some people, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to call them out for people I've coached, but for some people, I do think they're kind of incapable of thinking of these things. Like, they, like they, they, they're the equivalent of being out of shape. Like, they could get there eventually, um, but it would take them a lot of work, a lot of practice. I think for you, you you just aren't. Like, it's not that yeah. you can't, you, you actually just aren't. Like, if you thought a single time about this buckler, you would have turned it off in the last four games. You just don't think about right. it at all mm -hmm. um so i'm not telling you to get better at thinking about it i'm actually telling you to think about it <laughs> like, like it, it sounds so funny but um you know right. the reason why i wanted to separate this session into two usually is because initially i can see some glaring thing that could just be way better with a little bit of work and for you it really comes down to thinking about when it comes to pushing the lane whether or not you can rotate and then your items i, I know you said coming in you thought your itemization was a problem and so it's not like I'm like, God, you know, you're wrong or whatever. But the point is that uh, it will make a big difference for you almost instantaneously to just start thinking about what these items do. So if in this session, by the time we're done, if there's a specific item in the landing stage that you don't understand what it does or like why you would want to buy it, please ask. Mm -hmm. It's not like I didn't really learn the purpose of a salve until I was like seven and a half K. So, you know. It, it's not always as easy as it appears so just to be clear on that I, I would like to make sure you going into like the next week of practice or however long you want to wait until your next session that you are able to start thinking about these things and using those games as practice and then when I watch you I'll be like okay now that he's thinking about it you know what could be improved upon with his way of thinking because right now I can't even ask you what you were thinking to be honest I, I don't think you were thinking so um the first step is to get you to think. The second step is to make you think correctly. Uh, so... Okay. Let's see. So you're going Vlad's again. Definitely seems like copy-paste at this point. Every hero you've built. I think the um, Night Stalker game, it was fine. Vlad's is a luxury item. Like, do you know what I mean when I say luxury item? Have you watched my stream where I talk about luxury items? uh probably in the past okay so what luxury you... item means is like vlad's for an offlaner uh like a kaya for a storm uh obviously for storm it's pretty core but kaya for like some int caster sanjin yasha for 
a agi hero it literally makes you do what you're already doing better it doesn't change anything about what you're doing it just makes it so you have a bit more sustain you can maybe pressure the tower a bit more you get some regen and but it doesn't actually change any capabilities of your hero right like that's yeah. that's what i mean by luxury item um so in games where you were the night stalker you're really far ahead nothing really has to change I'm just controlling this part of the map, occasionally rotating. I don't need a specific item to rotate. Like, I don't need, like, a blink dagger or anything like that. Then, yeah, go Vlats, because it's just making what's currently happening better, and what's currently happening is good. Um, in this game, as a hero like Centaur, you almost always have to, like, transition to something changing. Like, meaning that you eventually become strong enough to fight them, you want to be participating in the game, what have you. So I don't think you going phase Vlads means you want to participate in fights. I Meaning, like, I don't think the moment you have Vlads, you're going to start fighting people. I don't think that's going to be how it works. But if you were to go, like, Vanguard, that's the farm, and then you go Blink to fight, or you go straight into Crimson to fight, that makes sense to me, right? Like, that to me, even if you went Hood Blink, you know, I think Crimson's better, but if you just went Hood for sustained farming, and then, because you know you're going to buy a pipe later... Um, but in this game, I do think Crimson's the best defensive item for your team. So I'd probably go Vanguard, Blink, Crimson. If we're like really far ahead, I could just go Crimson into Blink because Crimson means I'm fight, I'm farming more as opposed to Blink means once I get a Blink, I'm probably trying to fight. Uh, mm. The point is there are items for you that change this game and you're buying an item that is just a nice little luxury item, which these luxury items you're building are never terrible. But they're not always the right item. And uh, the last two games, I believe they're not the right items. So you guys are getting good pressure. This is how Centaur wants to play. You're not really supposed to leave your lane. Like, what you're doing in terms of map movement is absolutely fine. You seemed very inclined to do this on Mars as well as Night Stalker. Um, so on Centaur, since it's correct most of the time, you're going to look and feel really good about your map movements on Centaur most games, I would say. What I've noticed is, like, the way I naturally want to play the game if it's good for that hero, I'm naturally way better at that hero. <laughs> like, like that's it applies for everybody. Um, for mm -hmm. you, certain offlaners like to over-rotate. So these farming offlaners, they'll be really bad at. Um, for you, you clearly like to stay as top as long as possible. Um, so heroes like Centaur will be more beneficial to you. Uh, mm -hmm. But heroes like was... Night Stalker or Marge, you might struggle a bit more. What were you saying? I was going to ask if you had a suggestion of another hero. I could play like Centaur? The, yeah, yeah. Uh, Batrider. Batrider is the perfect example. Batrider, okay. Because okay. Batrider would probably be a good hero for you to practice because he does play a lot like Centaur where he's, he farms really heavily. He's looking for those early bots um, and then the bots kind of allow him to farm while fighting. But you could mm -hmm. also look for that one or two crucial rotations at like seven or eight minutes once you get Lasso. Every game's a bit different. Like if you watch Batrider, sometimes they don't take Lasso until level eight or nine. Uh, because they don't think they are strong enough to kill anyone yet, or they think it's better to get their boots to travel faster than it is to try to go for a kill. Um, so Batrider is a hero that's very much like Mars in the sense that maybe one or two crucial rotations can change his impact in the game, but then he's a lot more like Centaur in the sense that he does prefer to just play the efficiency game for like the first 10 minutes of the game. Um... The difference between Centaur and, and Batrider is that Centaur usually dies easier, meaning that he they'll, like he's more gankable, and also um, Centaur pressures the tower while Batrider doesn't. So like Batrider just kind of cuts creeps and plays efficiently, while Centaur can actually take the tower if he's winning. Batrider doesn't really take the tower. So some strengths and weaknesses of these two heroes. Uh, I just do believe. Uh, like on Centaur, you're never really going to rotate. Maybe you, you'll use your ultimate to help somewhere on the map. But you're not going to get better at this whole learning to leave the lane properly if you are playing Centaur, I think. I, I just can't imagine Centaur being a good hero to practice that. So you do have four heroes top. I think you see that, Nick. You do. So you're still playing this efficiency game. I think this is completely reasonable. We'll keep fast-forwarding. Trying to plant the main tree, to, yeah. Yeah, I didn't put it in a great spot, but it stays there for a bit. Yeah, for the most part, people just put it in base now, because it just gives free mangoes the rest of the game. Uh, and people are so good at getting rid of it now, that it usually doesn't stick around. So now you have this Vlad, so you are going like the, like I said Vanguard Blink, and you're going Vlad's Blink. I don't even think it's terrible. If you hadn't built Vlad's every game, and I thought maybe he like really wanted 
of Vlad's a specific game, I would have given you more credit, but I really, it just seems like you're buying Vlad's every single game, so. Uh, you know, I. Yeah, maybe a relic from the past. Yeah, I mean, Vlad's, is, few... Vlad's is never a, like I said, a bad item. It's like, if in doubt, go Vlad's, but, you know, that's not going to cut it for you if you want to keep climbing MMR to just buy a decent item. We're going to try to get you to going for the best items. And we got to start you somewhere. We got to tell you to start thinking about your items, so. Uh, overall, you are playing very efficiently, um, in regards to your own farm. I'd say just continuously staying safe as much as possible, but without your ultimate, yeah, I'd say without a ward. So let's rewind here. I was gonna say I was surprised you walked up for that without your ultimate, but let's rewind here. So I just used my ult, not just used, but it is on cooldown, so I know I'm vulnerable. And mm -hmm. it's 1643, and look at the map. So right now, you have no TP for bottom. So I'd be communicating to my team, hey guys, I have no TP for bottom. But what does your team being bottom also mean for you? Uh, that they either have to be there to defend it or they're coming top. Yeah. So what that means is that if you're if the enemy team sees you top, they're going to know you're alone because your teammates are bottom. So when it comes to like mid-game rotations and whether in like farming patterns, this applies to all three core roles. A lot of it has to do with not only what the opponent's doing, which we don't see any of them, but also what our team is doing. So, if your team is showing three bottom, your choice is to either go to your team or make it so you're not a target top. That's like your two choices. Um, and if you're farming this big camp, the one next to your tier two top, and you get smoke ganked, by all means, like, maybe you could have avoided it, and that's, like, stuff for 7k players to worry about. But that's, like, way better than walking up to this creep wave and dying to it. Because, like, it's very easy and convenient for the opponent to just be like, we're going to push this wave. Oh, there's a centaur. Kill him, you know? Um, mm -hmm. as opposed to them having to coordinate a smoke gang to kill you at your, at your jungle camp. So mm -hmm. we talked about, or I've talked about many times, jungle camps are for passing the time when there's nothing clear for you to do. That's what jungle camps are for. So the reason why I'm mentioning it is it is actually better for you to jungle right now because it is not clear what you should be doing because your team's showing bottom. You can't be there. I don't think your team should even be there, but... Because they are there, we're going to, you know, try to adjust accordingly, which is to not show top. Uh, mm -hmm. Showing both side lanes past, like, the 15-minute mark is generally just really bad. Um, unless you have, like, four heroes and an Ember Spirit who's unkillable or something. <coughs> okay, so just a very predictable death based on what your teammates are showing. So what I mean is either you're going to farm this lane and your three heroes are going to die bottom and you're going to be like, why is my team feeding bottom? Or you're going to die top. That's like the two choices based on what you just did there. The enemy team, unless they're just potatoes doing nothing, are going to gank one of you. They're going to be like, oh, like good players would either say, centaur's alone top, or no centaur bottom, kill them all. You know, that kind of thing. That's what a good player would call out there. So you don't want to present the opponent with that easy of a decision. And sometimes even 4K players can make that decision, as you just saw there, they did. Okay. Um... What's Divine 1? Is it four and a half? About. Okay. I think this is a reasonable fight. You're playing with your team on the top half of the map. You don't have Blink yet, so you still do want to stay here in general. A bit overzealous since you had no Centaur ultimate. So this is definitely, like, great that you took a fight, meaning, like, you had your ultimate, you guys were together, um, but you still don't have your blink yet. So, like, you take this fight, they're showing on an objective, you guys win. Now, right about now, based on the lens, we see mid, we see bottom. Try to pause here. <coughs> this is what, am I, is this your player perspective? No, it's... Uh, yeah. Oh, it is. Okay, so you are looking bottom. I was, yeah, I was checking the Meepo. He he already started getting out of control. So at uh, what point do you think the opponent's very likely to fight you? Um, if well, they are I would going say probably to fight when, you. Yeah, probably when they had the most information, which is seeing four heroes top and possibly the Razor bottom. Well, I'll give you another question to be better leading into the answer. Once okay. you guys take a fight and kill some heroes, what it is very likely that the opponent's going to fight you? Uh, well, we have no abilities. No ultimates, they do. 
They have okay, so my emphasis ability. is that you killed some heroes on the opponent team. So when is it likely yeah. they're going to fight you? When they respawn. Okay, <laughs> like I know, like all those things you were answering were like <laughs> relevant, you know, uh, but uh, yeah. they weren't what I was going for. Um, so yes, like it's a very easy habit to slip out of. But when you win a team fight where you used your skills, like you just said. The point is to either be strong enough, like you have to recognize the difference between strong enough to do something immediately or to only be strong enough to make use of the time that they're dead and then immediately back off. Okay, and then this is an example where you used your skills, you don't have a razor, you don't have an oracle ulti, no witch doctor ulti, no centaur ultimate, and they're respawning. So this is a point where what you can do is you back off as a group and then if you see one or two heroes TB bottom or whatever, or one or two heroes go to, or go mid, then you can immediately kill this tower, right? Mm -hmm. But in that case, what happens is they either show mid or bottom and you kill this tower, or they TP three heroes to their own safe lane. In which case, they're not doing anything. They just TP to their own safe lane with no objectives. So that immediately allows you to clear mid, to clear bottom, maybe set up on the bounty runes bottom. Like, whatever. It gives you map control if they all come top. But right. instead, you're giving them the option to kill you when this guy's respawning. So he's going to TP in. They're going to fight you. Yeah, I mean, every time the opponent is... Like, we kill the opponent with our skills, you really have to think very closely about what their respawn timers are and whether or not they'll fight you. And usually, I go with the assumption that they are going to fight us and... Uh, let them prove that they're not going to. That's that's the assumption I always go with. So, like I said, if they show two or three heroes other places on the map, by all means, like, kill the fucking tower. But, uh, in the time that they're not showing, earlier I told you when there wasn't a fight going on, that your job to pressure top, you should walk into the trees while you're waiting. This other time, I told you you could jungle. Okay. So... A really big lapse of judgment that comes from your bracket, like 4k, 5k, maybe even 6k, it just kind of gets slowly better as you climb up the rung, but it's definitely a problem for all of you, um, mm -hmm. is, is knowing what to do when the opponent has options, okay? So what I mean is, in these examples, like maybe they were ganking you top, maybe they were fighting bottom, maybe they were going to fight you top, maybe they were just going to disperse and farm bottom and mid. Like, all these exam and the other one, uh, the one where you TP'd to help the Jug, uh, maybe they were staying right. mid-grouped up, maybe they were dispersing to farm, right? Both of, all of these examples, they had two options, maybe three, okay? And so yeah. your job as a player is to account for these options as best as you can. So, um, how do I, I'm trying to, I, I had a way of describing this to you, uh... Oh, I was going to ask you a question. So, in the example where you were Mars, compared mm -hmm. to when you were Centaur, why was one of the answers to jungle, and why the other answer was to go hide in the trees? Like, why would I want you to hide in the trees as Mars in that one situation where you were top lane pushing it? But on Centaur, I'd rather you just go back to the jungle. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a good question because it's a hard it's a hard answer. But the the simple way to word it is the jungle in some cases is just as dangerous as it is to lane. So in your Mars game, you were top lane. I'm gonna I know you can't see my cursor. So you were up here. Mm -hmm. The opponent had just shown four heroes here, and they had not shown anywhere else since then. So in this case, their option is that they're either grouped up around here, they're grouped up around here, or they're dispersing. Like that's their two options, right? Like mm. that's that's that that's those the or three, I guess. But either way, one of them is they're grouped up going top or bottom, and the other one is that they're just farming. So I will always assume the more dangerous option, meaning I will always assume they are grouped up. Like if they're just farming, that's cool. We want to stay near where we're farming. But if they're grouped up and instead of farming here, you're farming here, are you any safer? No. So, Probably less safe yeah, you're closer. actually less safe by farming jungle there. But I don't want you to leave this area. So you're staying around the top area for the, all the reasons to create pressure here. But the only safe option is to go up here. Like, that's the only, that's the safest option. But when you are Centaur, 
and the lane was here, your option was either here, here, or the lane. Which isn't here and here clearly safer than the lane, right? Yeah. So in that case, you know, play the efficiency. You're still playing. It's like the same idea, but the goal is you're just playing safer, but you're playing the same part of the map. So in this example, go into the trees because they're coming from mid if they were coming. Like if they were coming, they'd be coming from mid, which they'd be actually run into you first here as opposed to here. And this, in the other example, they would be coming from, when you were Centaur, they'd be coming from this direction. Like, if you really think about it, like, I'll rewind if you want me to, but they would have been coming from this direction because there's a lane to farm top, and uh, this area is where they would be. So if you go to here, you're much safer than if you go to here. Um, and then in the... Um, what, what was the other example? It was the Centaur, the Mars... And I think that was the it. other game was Night Stalker. Yeah, I'm trying know. to remember. I think the other example was one was also one of these two heroes. It's fine though. The, the I was really going for the emphasis of you go with the safer option. Sometimes that's jungling. Sometimes that's hiding in trees. But the point is, the emphasis is where you are on the map. So if you ever surrender control of this top area as Radiant, it's like really hard to play Dota. If they bring four heroes. Okay, like, they took control of that area, let them have it. They brought four heroes to the dead lane, and they're not doing anything. But right. if you give them this area for free, what that effectively does is give them this entire map for free. Like, that's actually what it gives them, because if they can push this out with one hero, then suddenly all five of their heroes could easily group up in the bottom half of the map. So as an offlaner, a lot of the times, your responsibility is to put a little bit of pressure on top, if the carry's not doing it. If the carry starts doing it, you can start considering playing behind the carry, you know, relieving pressure on mid, whatever. But in general, in your bracket, most carries are not going to rotate to your lane. So in that case, it's your responsibility as these bow riders, centaurs, you know, Axe, if he ever comes back in a meta, but he sucks right now, so don't pick him. These heroes continuously pressure top and then occasionally leave to fight with their team. Like, that's what these heroes are going to do. And so on that Mars game is the same thing. Um, recognizing your limitations when you're walking up to the tower. You know, when you go back and watch the Mars game that I reviewed with you, you know, we talked about just walking up to the tower and dying. So all of these things are decisions you're making, but you don't really realize you're making them, I think. You're not, like, consciously walking up to this tower. You're not realizing when you TP to top that you're glued there for 80 seconds. So if something shitty happens, you're just there. Um, but if I mention it to you where it felt good to TP here, didn't it? Or whatever. Usually people can be like, yeah, it did. Or no, it didn't. And if you're ever doing a bad feeling TP, usually you should either TP somewhere else or more commonly not TP at all. Uh, the most yeah. most common answer for a bad TP is just not TPing. When you TP'd on Mars, back to bottom lane. When you TP'd to top lane uh, actively on Mars and then it backfired. Uh, in this game of Centaur, you haven't really TP'd up until now, actually. And this is a reasonable TP, because we saw one top, one mid, your Razor's bottom, you have a blink. The problem is, none of your team really followed up. I think this was a bit rushed, but I don't even think that's an unreasonable TP, because of what you saw on the map. Like, I might have even made that TP, so I think that was... I'm not going to flame any of that. I think that could just be a situation in the game where you went for a choice. So you don't have a TP on you. Bad call there. Uh, what items do your team have? Aquila and Essence Ring? Okay. Which is weird that you have an M-Claw. I guess it's not terrible on your hero. Okay. You really did not like that Pangolier on the jug there. Okay, so now we're snowballing some kills. Okay. At this point, this is pretty much what Centaur does. You get to play one position for the first 15 minutes, and then you fight with your team the rest of the game. That's pretty much what you do. Uh, so you're going for Pipe. I, like I said, I think Pipe or Crimson are both reasonable. I think you can agree with me, though, that Crimson's probably better. Just because mm -hmm. of Meepo. Well, it's, it's been a while at... Essentially, I only really started picking up Dota again about... A year, year and a half after taking like a three-year hiatus, so there's there's like a lack of item changing. I see. Like, I see. So I when I said the Vlad's was like a relic from the past, it's from 
kind of back when Vlad's is like broken, and I know it's kind of still good-ish now. Yeah. But there's a lot of like small changes along the way that I missed for sure. Okay. I see. This is just super awkward for you, <laughs> for you guys. At yeah, this point. I. I wanted to leave immediately, but they all kept running in. I should have. I I don't I don't tend to look at this too much. I think there was nothing else for you to do on the map, so your choice was to either jungle or show up to this fight. And if your team's gonna insist on bringing everybody, especially the jug, I think you kind of just have to go. Um, so I don't tend to look at that too much. Like if there was definitely something you could have been doing differently, then I would cons talk to you about it. But in this option, it's just super awkward, and sometimes that just happens. Okay, still no TP. Don't really know what's up with that. All of a sudden, maybe you're, maybe you're uh, under pressure or something. Um. Okay. It was about an hour before this, cause oh, I only I, I only had I only had the two from like a week ago. So this is a, a little bit of rust, and then like I might as well try to get one more replay out of it. I see. Um. Just always know that when your carries are farming in this area, the bottom half of the map, that they're in hyper, they're in tons of danger. Obviously, uh, you know, I don't know how long it'll take people to realize that eighty percent of their deaths are bottom, but uh, are on radiant, they're on bottom, and dire, they're on top. But uh, the point is, when you're off lane, your two choices are to sit behind them or to play hyper aggressive somewhere else. Like meaning that you're basically forcing the opponent to gank one of you. Um, and they're going to. That's pretty much what you're accepting, is that they're going to mm -hmm. do that. So your two choices, like I said, are to try to play efficiency and kind of feed. That's like the EG way to play. Or to uh, sit behind the Razor. So if you think you have kill potential or like uh, turn potential sitting behind the Razor bottom, then you should. But uh, I just want you to know that that really is your two only good decisions. Um, if you're doing anything else, it's probably suboptimal. So... Uh, really be polarized with that decision if somebody's playing dangerous parts of the map. And it's always it's always the dead lane. It's always the safe lane area. Like, I don't want to say always. 80% of the time, 90% of the time, it's, it's that area. So, like, with that Razor being down there like that, you can either make it a hyper-aggressive play top or mid, or you sit behind the Razor. Right here, you guys saw them go on the Razor, and you saw a Lifestealer, so you went on them. That's like a great example of like making use of the fact that your teammates playing like that. Okay, um, just because mm -hmm. your teammates are playing like that doesn't mean the opponents are smart enough to capitalize on it fully. Like it's just as bad that Life Stealer proceeds to show at your tier two mid when his entire team just showed on bottom. Right, that, that's like just as bad as what your Razor is doing. So it's mm -hmm. really important, like you guys did there, to capitalize on that. But sometimes what I've realized in your bracket is people don't really understand why it worked. You know, like like something worked and they don't fully understand why, but that's like what I mean is if you make a hyper aggressive play somewhere else, then that's like effectively okay for what your razor's doing in the bottom lane. Um, but if you were just like jungling or whatever, I would be unhappy with that decision. I'd say either, you know, hyper aggressive farm and force them to kill you instead or help your razor. Okay, so now got rid of the fairy okay. M claw over greater fairy fire. I can't really argue that either way. So it's like, yeah, I think your pipe is reasonable. Um, I would have even considered four staff against um, Life Stealer Pango Meepo, just to reset the fight for your team. But then again, like I don't think that's a game-winning item. I would hope your supports would buy that. So you're clearing mid while they're showing. This is good. We'll be wrapping it up soon here. Okay. Overall, that whole play was very good. Wait for your team to respawn. They're all here. Four-man stomp hog. Okay. Wow. Opponents obviously overstayed their welcome. You guys got a kill. What do you do with it? You get an outpost. Good. Going for the ags. I think that's reasonable. Probably a bit late for Crimson now, so if you weren't going to go Crimson before, I wouldn't be going in now. This is a very good place to sit. You're controlling the map, but I, since the Meepo was dead, I would have, uh, let's see. Oh, it's not your fault, actually. It's supposed to be, oh, I know. Okay, you guys are controlling top outposts. This is all pretty good, actually. 
So my question for you real quick about map control. Mm -hmm. What is this lane to you now, the top lane? Um, it would be perhaps the fallback objective for when Meepo spawns. I, I think we were going to try to pressure the mid, maybe try to force a, a bad reaction. Okay, my because question, my question real quick, sorry, I, I should be clear with this question because you're answering reasonably, I'm just asking questions poorly. So, um, your jug's showing bottom. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you guys top lane? Like, does should anybody uh, TP back to this tier 3 to farm this wave? Uh, well, the jug can't really be with us. Uh, he could TP to the shrine, well, and the top lane is pushing super bad. So, your choice right now is for your jug which he doesn't have a TP, to TP back to base. What if one of you guys TP back to base? Like, anybody that isn't Jug? Uh, we would have to back off. And Jug would I have would to back say. off, right? And if he doesn't back off, yeah. he's probably going to die, or at least giving the opponent the potential to make something happen while he's doing this, right? So, yeah. <laughs> all these things considered, you don't really want to run here. So, the way that this should be played, and can be communicated, is Meepo's dead for 25. Jug should meet your team mid, because you guys aren't there with him yet. He should meet you guys. There's camps to farm. There's bounty runes to get. While Meepo's dead, one of you should clear top wave right here. You should clear this one. Because what that is effectively doing, if you do that over like the course of three waves, it's effectively de-pushing this without ever coming here. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because eventually your wave will just out-push it because you killed three waves in a row. So right. what you guys can do is... As long as, you know, you're safe, what you should do as a team is, like, sway between top and bottom, where you clear this wave, and then you run back to mid and bottom. Clear this wave, run back to mid and bottom. The point is that you're never showing here and here at the same time, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. kind of the point. Um, so it's something you can watch people doing, um, but what if I would be doing is I'd see Meepo dead, and it's 2954, I'd say, be careful bottom jug, I'm clearing top. Like, that's what I would say. If people feed, so be it, okay? Like, I would rather promote you to do the perfect play um, and communicate it as well than to not do anything or just to just kind of rely on your teammates. People will generally be 50-50 on listening, but if they listen, you can own. So my point is, though, is we don't ever want to go clear this wave because then if we go back to here, by the time they're all alive, we've surrendered control of this entire half of the map, right? Like, this whole area we've lost control of if we TP one hero to here. We have two good wards. What's our next major objective? Uh, The next major one would probably be trying to get Roche. Would be Roche, right? You're um, not going high ground without Roche, right? Yeah. So, I can't remember if the Meepo already killed it. No, it's already dead. It's going to be respawning in the next two or three minutes. Or, sorry, two to five minutes. So, the point being, though, is if your next major objective is Roche, you're allowed to pressure bottom until Roche is alive, right? But mm -hmm. I would be saying to myself, I only want to pressure bottom if these two wards stay up. Like, these two wards matter to me more than this bottom tower because these two wards represent my team controlling Roche. So, these are all things to think about with your team and how you can play into this equation. But generally speaking, if one or two of your teammates is a complete potato, it's going to be really hard to, to pull any of this off. But knowing what you're looking to do is really important because maybe you can confidently make calls um, as an offlaner because that you are definitely a role that is responsible for communicating. Um, okay, so in this situation, um, Meepo's dead, so I'm looking to be a bit more greedy and clear the wave. You can even sh potentially show top while Jug shows bottom, but you got to be real careful in spots like this. So he's going to pressure the tower. I do think it's just a bit of a travesty that this wave goes uncleared. But you guys are pressuring mid. Forced to use the Oracle ult. Notice how much better it would have been if you just cleared top wave right there. Mm -hmm. Now effectively, one of you is most likely going to have to go back to base. At least, yep, there's Razor going back to base. Shocker ends up canceling his TP. Now you're locked in here. Okay, let's see what ends up happening here. Go back to your player perspective. At this yep. point, I was unsure where to go. Yep. Why are you forced to go here? Uh, didn't cut the wave. Yeah. No, like, this isn't a perfect example. What does the opponent get to do if they want to? What if these guys were really good knowing they're supposed to play around Roche and you guys just got done winning a fight in their jungle? What are they going to do? Deward the whole thing. They're going to deward it all. And you wouldn't have ever had to come here if you just cut top, right? So this mm. is a perfect example of why it's so important to cut top. Because you are controlling a part of the map while accomplishing the same thing that you are doing right now. 
okay? They're like, this is how important wards are. This is actually a pretty high level concept that in my opinion, when brought to my attention, is actually really fucking basic that even like 6K, 7K players do not do. Like they just don't do this. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to yell at 6K players for TPing back to base when they could just cut. Um, like, I, it's a really big deal to control these wards, especially when you have Roche. When you're dire, it's like you're supposed to control, uh, you know, this area when you're dire. And what you'll see a lot is people cutting this wave and cutting this wave. And once you care about Roche, you don't really care about this lane at all on either side, right? Like, mm -hmm. you guys could pressure bottom for the time being because the Meepo was dead and Roche wasn't up yet. So you were able to take this tower. But if either of those was not the case, I think taking that tower would have been a mistake. Like, I think, why bother taking this tower? If you get Roche, it's much more important. Um, so, like, nothing worth surrendering control of Roche is worth doing. Um, so, yeah, this is simply showing you the impact of not cutting the wave. So you can understand how important that wave is. If they do deward you, which they might. If anything, they're at least moving back on the map. So your the usefulness of your wards is nothing. Like imagine if you guys were just camping this hill, uh, where your two wards are, and cutting mid and top, as opposed to what just happened now. Like look at the map control in comparison. Uh, so you guys end up smoking your own ward. Not a bad smoke, you guys smoked your own vision, but of course the enemy team's pretty bad for not dewarding you after seeing you top. It's very obvious that you should have wards around there, and the thing I would be, if I'm a support, I'd be like, I'm gonna deward this area, if they don't have wards, so be it. Like, that means they're bad, but I'm gonna make sure they don't have wards there. Like, I think your supports are very reasonably warding certain parts of the map. Um, okay. So now you guys are just going high ground with no Aegis. Little impatient, but the life stealer just fed. So I guess. Yeah, he didn't expect the mind breaker to silence him. Yeah. So that worked out. Definitely need to be paying attention to Roche. Okay. Let me rewind this here. What happened here? Does your razor being a Papega or what? <laughs> Let's find out. Okay, your razor on the retreat chose to farm a jungle camp. Okay, guys, when yeah, you're retreating from the opponent base, so this is this is not for you. This is for everyone else. When you're retreating from the opponent base. Do not stop to hit a fucking neutral camp. Because if the yeah, opponent's going to fight you... Too. Like, if the opponent's going to fight you, it's 90% going to happen immediately after you leave. Like, immediately. So, just don't be retards, guys. Come on. Or idiots, sorry. 2020. Political, politically correct. Uh, okay. So now your Witch Doctor feeds. So, you know, at this point, I didn't have anything to teach you. I just can teach everyone else that's uh, being that guy that jungles all the time. So now you guys lose Roche. Quite unfortunate that your Razor wanted that one big camp. I hope it was worth it, buddy. So you go clear bottom while they're Roching. This is reasonable. Uh, at this point, I was going to say, you do, like, that catapult was probably the, the, the straw. But you actually get away, surprisingly. Uh, they wanted to fight, so I stuck around. Okay, so you just popped ultimate, and they have Aegis. Interesting decisions. Okay, so this is how Dota works, buddy. I'm gonna rewind for you. This isn't that you should exactly know this now. I want to remind you that everything I'm telling you is a work in progress, meaning like itemizing in the landing stage, rotating in the mid game, to really focus on the thought process rather than getting the right results, okay? Because especially since you're coming back, it'll be even easier for me to tell you when once you're doing it, but it's even more important for your own growth to understand that the overall message is in the way you think about it, not in the results that you're getting. So when you're pressuring, or when you're pushing out bottom, why was it safe to push out bottom here? Uh, they were doing Roche. They, they were, were doing Roche, right? Map. So just like when they took mid in that Mars game, for the next 20 or for like the next 10 seconds it was safe to like farm bottom or farm top and that's what you guys did right mm -hmm. like because they they physically could not be anywhere by the within 10 seconds so when they when they kill Roche you have to have an internal timer based on whatever heroes they have based on whether or not they have this outpost based on whether or not they have boots of travel if they were to immediately run here or immediately TP to bottom lane, whether or not they'll be on top of you. 
Like that that like how long do you have until they do that? So like in your game, if they were mid, you have to you can clear top until they would have immediately TP'd here and been there. You could clear bottom until they run here. You know, like uh <coughs> I know you can't see, I forget. You you can clear like bottom lane until they run from mid to bottom. Like you have as much time as it takes them to get to where they were to where you are now. So like right now they just killed Roche, right? They just killed it. You see Meepo. I, okay, I got this wave. I think we're good. I see Meepo. I'd even be a bit concerned because I don't see the fourth Meepo. I would probably, at most, double-edge this wave and immediately blink out. I don't even know if I would go for this wave, to be honest with you. Like, I think mm -hmm. going for this wave is a question mark that I would consider. But sticking around and just farming this camp or farming this wave, you know, like this is the safe part of the map is just, once again... Uh, not respecting why I refer to this lane as the dead lane 10 times every coaching session. So my emphasis, guys, is when you're farming the dead lane, there's a reason why it's safe, and that reason is usually very short-lived. Like, it is very brief, and it's very important you are as efficient as possible and as safe as possible in this lane because of all the reasons we've talked about. So I would have maybe double-edged that and immediately blinked out. I'm only saying that, like, I probably wouldn't have even gone for that wave, but if you were really pushing it, you could have definitely, like, based on results-oriented, you could have double-edged that wave. Now there's, like, this super awkward fight you guys are taking outside of base. I understand your team stuck around, but this has to be partly on you to be like, no. Like, I'm calling this fight as, like, you guys are fighting them with an Aegis outside of base, no objective for you to gain. They strictly have an advantage because they have an Aegis, and you already blew your ultimate. And taking fights in the dead lane in the last three replays I've watched, how often has that ever gone well? Uh, the first fight, I mean. What I mean is sometimes you guys would fight, you would lose, and then you'd four-man bottom, and the enemy team would for some reason run into you anyways and lose. But the first time you guys fight them in the bottom lane, like where all your team's like scrambling to get there and stuff, it never works. It's like 0 for 5 so far. Um... So, you know, you, you can try to have the confidence to call that dead lane fights are not good most of the time. If they're showing two heroes top, by all means, you know, fight bottom. But they, they did not do that, so. Okay. Uh, somehow you guys end up winning that. The enemy team just did the reverse throw. You guys lost two lanes of racks, though. We'll be wrapped up soon. I've gone a bit over, but that's okay. Uh... Yeah, at this point, it's almost over. I think from here... Yeah, this happens, and I die, and I'm down for so long that they just they death just fall down mid. Yeah, okay. before I can even respawn. Yeah, I know. So I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna emphasize that I think the rotations, the itemization, and the information you're giving on the map as an offlaner are gonna be what it takes for you to be really clear about um, the issues you're having. Right? Like you're also said you're coming back to Dota. These are things that I, I'm just going to say one last time. I know I've harped on it a lot. One at a time, isolate as many factors as you can. So if you're going to work on rotations or itemization, you know, just play the same hero five times in a row. And then once you feel confident on itemization at least a bit, you know, you can play a different hero five times. Um, this is just stuff that, given a week or two, can change drastically if you're thinking about it a lot. And I think you're quite capable. So do you have any questions before we wrap it up? Um, no, not at this time. I think okay. probably next time I'll have more item-specific questions. Just yeah, so please. Yeah, well, it, it bit, might even help if you just write it out down. of knowledge. Yeah, sure. specifically like Crimson Guard. Essentially, when I stopped playing the first time, it, I think it just came out and it was pretty garbage. So yeah, it was bad. I still bad. have a negative. Like I'm not entirely sure when it's best to build that because I've never really experienced it when it was uh, good. Meepo Brood. Visage, PL, Witch Doctor Ultimate as well. No, or is that I wouldn't do it niche? for Witch. I wouldn't itemize okay. it for a support. Okay. Um, it's usually when it's their strongest hero, like yeah. Meepo, like I said, PL. Um, lots of small hits. Yeah, lots of small hits, but it's also like a very impactful hero, right? Um, so it just yeah, I'd say Lycan's another example. But even then, it's like worse against Lycan because he can maybe purge it with uh, Book Three and stuff. But not a very popular hero. Um, but it's, it's when you want a defensive item and their most powerful hero is an illusion hero or a summon hero. That's 
-hmm. that's when you'd get crimson so um yeah any any other last questions real quick i know i interrupted you a bit there uh no not at this point no it's already a lot sweet sounds good man feel free to review it as much as possible it'll be up on youtube mm -hmm. pretty soon and uh, uh oh i uh, guess yeah one more uh is there any way we can get a a personal vod download of this or will it just be on youtube later um it'll be on youtube later but you can also just go okay. to my vods of my twitch channel and just see it okay there. so cool. um i don't think there would be any benefit to giving you like a personal one you can just find it there so okay sweet thanks man all right thank you see ya Thank you.